Welcome to this week's edition of Word of Truth Podcast. This is Jordan. And this is Jaron. And this week we're going to be jumping in to the discussion of the Pharisees got wrong. Um, we're going to kind of look at why Christ calls them out, what they were doing. Um, because when you think about the Pharisees kind of in a general sense, they were looked to as the like the religious people of the culture. Everyone looked to them as the standard of religion. Yet when Christ comes on the scene and any interaction he has with them, we see him constantly trying to correct them, constantly calling them out. Um, he has an entire chapter in Matthew dedicated to telling them what they're doing wrong. And so let's kind of look at why, what they got wrong and why they were called out by Christ. So here's uh, like one thing that they did well. OK, is uh, they feared being too liberal minded. So in a sense, that's good uh, because they were afraid of taking away from the word of God. Right. They, they didn't want to take away from it. They want to make sure that they kept it and they kept it well. Now, the issue with that is they were so afraid of veering to the, the left that they took their eyes off that straight and narrow road. And they actually veered way to the right, right? They, they got to the point where they were so afraid of being too liberal, so afraid of uh, that they created all these different traditions, all these different laws. So they added to the word of God. And what we sometimes uh, do a poor job of is looking at the danger of doing that. Right. We will preach about liberalism. We'll look at and and, and kind of condemn those who I mean, because you don't want to take away from the word of God. But you get to a point where you're so concerned about becoming too liberal that you become far too strict and you add to God's word and you begin to create a law based off of your opinion where the Lord has left for the general opinion. Um. Just to make clear what we're talking about when we're saying liberal and strict, the way, and I guess kind of just general, how the Pharisees came about as a, you know, a sect of the Jews was they looked at what had happened in their past. They had looked at how Israel had fallen short so many times, how they had ended up in captivity, and how all of that came from them not keeping the law. Because it was when the people fell away from keeping the commandments of the law, they lost the heart of worshiping God, then they would end up in very bad situations. They were becoming, as you're saying, too liberal, as in taking liberties that should not be taken in God's law and falling away, worshiping other idols, yada, like, you know, going to the left or to the right, worshiping other things than God. Um, and so we see at the end of the Old Testament in Malachi, that whole book is kind of dedicated to this idea of like, you guys have fallen off the wagon with your worship. You're not giving God the firstborn or the best of your sheep when you're sacrificed. You know, your heart just isn't where it needs to be. And from that, over the course of the 400 years of silence in between where that leads off and where Christ comes on the scene, you see the rise of this group of people being the Pharisees who are hyper focused on keeping the law. And so this is to fall or to put safeguards up so that they don't end up in a spot of worship like they were before. But in doing so, they created so many barriers that they got so far off track trying to keep the law that other things fell apart within their religion. Yeah, it was like an extreme overreaction, right? Instead of just looking back and, and seeing the word of God, it's like, okay, let's put some other things in place here to ensure we don't go off of but because they put in these different traditions because they added these different opinions that they had and made those opinions divine law they actually left the uh, obeying the lord because now they're not just keeping the law now they're keeping their own law right they're not keeping god's law they, they've changed it they don't, they've altered it um, and so when we talk about what they got wrong, here, here's part of it. They overreacted to what was happening, or I guess an overreaction that might, I mean, you can never overreact to sin, I guess, but they incorrectly 
reacted to what had happened instead of just turning their sight back to God and to his guidance. Um, and I'm, I'm sure that we're going to bring up some passages here. We see that they were more focused on keeping their traditions because they thought that this is how we remain holy. It's almost as though we found a better way than what the Lord has provided us. Yeah, and uh, a very good chapter to look at to kind of see see exactly what Christ thought of the Pharisees and what he calls out for them doing wrong is Matthew chapter 23. Um, and there are a couple of things that I had kind of written out that I want to look at to pull out what is wrong. Because like you said, there really isn't much of an overreaction to sin. We should hate it. We should despise it. We should do everything we can to stay away from it. But the issue is whenever you get so hyper-focused on the appearance of what you're doing to stay away from sin, and you lose the heart of what God is trying to tell you to do. And that's where they found themselves. They were so focused on appearing righteous among men, so focused on appearing as though they're keeping the entirety of the law and following all of these traditions that then they put on the same level as the law, that they lost the sight of the message in the heart of what God actually wants. And we see this in Matthew chapter 23. The one that I kind of wanted to pull out to begin is in verse 23. Where here we have Christ speaking, and he says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you pay tithe of mint and anise, and have come in, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, being justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Lying guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. And so here we see it's like they're hyper-focused on keeping, in this case, the tithing perfectly. Like a tenth of everything I have is the Lord's. But they're losing the idea of we're doing this because we have faith in God or maintaining justice and mercy to those who, you know, for whatever reason, may not be able to do these things. When you get so hyper focused on you have to work to be saved, then you lose the concept of this justice and mercy that God gives us through his grace. You know, he, he desires for us, as it says at the end of that verse, that you have ought to have done these things like you're doing good things. But you cannot do these commandments and think that they will save you without realizing the rest of this. It takes both, you know. Yeah, and I want to add to that in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 9. It says, now when he had departed, this being Jesus from there, he went into their synagogue. And behold, there was a man who had a withered hand. And they asked him, saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath that they might accuse him? Then he said to them, what man is there among you who has one sheep? And if, if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not lay hold of it and lift it out. Of how much more value then is a man than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. And then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out and it was restored as whole as the other. Then the Pharisees went out and plotted against him how they might destroy him. We bring this out because here they had decided how they would define what work was. Um, and, and they looked at what Jesus had done as, you know, unlawful work. Well, what was Jesus doing on the Sabbath? He's healing this man, right? How is that wrong? You're taking away this mercy, uh, this grace of God, as you brought up. And as you continue on through Matthew chapter 12, you see Jesus is trying to tell them, look, even David ate of the food that was for the priest alone, for he and his men were hungry as they came back from a battle. And so they were given this food because the priest who knew the law saw that there was also men in need and they showed this mercy to them. So it's not we have these laws and we need to follow them. But understand that there is mercy and there is grace that can be shown. But it's when we get our own ideas about these laws and we hold our opinions that uh, these can come become sinful. We become uh, have a, a mindset like the Pharisees. Um, go ahead. Oh, and a lot of kind of what's going with this and the big the big point that I want to draw out, which we've kind of been hitting on. I don't know if we stated it yet explicitly is the Pharisees had it all right according to the outside. They looked righteous, they quote-unquote acted righteous, but on the inside, they were not right with God. On the inside, 
as it says in verses 27 and 28. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You're like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. And so for me, the biggest thing that I want to kind of pull out that they got wrong is they they appeared righteous on the outside, but they were not converted. They were not right on the inside. Their heart was not where it needed to be. So they did all of the actions as would appear righteous to men, according to God. But their heart was not righteous before God. And this kind of ties in to what I what kind of set my mindset on this was Hosea 6.6. 6 which it says here, for I desire mercy and not sacrifice and the knowledge of God rather than a burnt offering. And this shows kind of what God, where his mindset is. He would rather us be internally converted to him than to do all of these commandments without the right heart. That's not to say that you can have the right heart without doing the commandments as we saw earlier. Um, but the emphasis needs to be that our internal man is converted to God. And then our actions will kind of, you know, that will be naturally if we are truly faithful and converted to God. Naturally, we will be doing the things that he should do and appear righteous before men. We shouldn't be trying to prove our own righteousness just to appear righteous, you know. So I kind of have a thought. Going with this and. uh I was just kind of thinking one thing I try and do as I do a study, as we talk about these things where we do kind of look at it in an abstract way. Um, how do we bring it to now? So when we discuss our responsibility to those who have been withdrawn from, and, and maybe we've discussed this before, but maybe you haven't heard uh, you know, those podcasts, or maybe we haven't discussed it in this way. There is a commandment from those who are unruly for those who walk away from the Lord to, as we can read, not even eat with such a one. Okay, there's the commandment. But if I have an opportunity to sit down and have a conversation with somebody, now I, I look at this commandment, why do I keep it? Do, do I look at this and say, I'm not even going to eat with such a one? And, and I have this heart where I'm not no longer loving them, showing compassion for them, trying to reach out to them. Because God's law says not even to eat with such a one. So I break off all communication, which is normally what happens. Um, how do I handle this? How do I not have uh, this mindset like the Pharisees as I approach such a command? I'm kind of asking you uh, for your thoughts. Uh, yeah, well, because kind of what you're like, what you're kind of bringing out is when we deal with these situations, are we doing the actions to appear like, OK, you know, this man over at this congregation handled this properly. So kudos to him. Or are we doing it because we know what God said and how this will affect the other person spiritually according to God's word? Because the reason God has put those kind of things in place is because he knows, like, for instance, not even eating with such a one, knowing that there's that loss of communion together, as you being the person who has lost that communion weighs on you. And spiritually, hopefully, will make you question where you are and how it has gotten to the point of affecting your life in such a way it has. You know, we're supposed to be doing this with the hope of driving that person to God. By realizing the consequences of their actions, you know, not out of evil intent because or for us to appear righteous, like, you know, I'm too good to eat with this person. It's no, I'm trying to help this person. And this is at this point in time, this is the best way we can help them, you know, because this is the only way maybe we can get their heart to soften or maybe we can open their eyes. And that has to, like, if you don't have that mindset, as anyone can tell you. It causes this like those types of actions to fall on their face if it's not with this kind of heart. So as we specifically here, I, I kind of want to deal a little bit with someone who not like a specific person, but as we kind of look in our own lives, 
and we look and we talk and we have sermons preached about how withdrawal as we have to take church discipline against an individual who is unruly, who has walked away or is living in sin, and that sin has been brought to their attention. When they are withdrawn from, we hear this phrase, but that is not the final point, right? That's not the end of our responsibility. Well, when somebody's withdrawn from, normally what we kind of see is there is just this like, okay, well, you know, th this person has walked away. So now, you know, they've made these choices. I'm not even to eat with such a one. What am I to do? Right. And, and we almost look at it like it is the end of my responsibility. But is how do we have the mindset of, you know, I, I keep these commandments, but maybe there's an opportunity here, uh, you know, maybe to meet and have coffee and discuss these matters. Am I therefore breaking that commandment of God? There is a passage and I'm trying to quickly look it up. Because I actually was just referencing this the other day. Let me see. Take two seconds, try and fill time and awkwardly speak. Well, here. I, so and, when we put this into our podcast for uh, for you as you're listening, you know, if you have questions, please reach out. If you would like to do a study, please reach out. Um, you know, it, if you think that we misspoke bring it to our attention right we do have honest hearts we are just searching for the truth and this is something that we're trying to work through ourselves how do we refrain as we look from where the pharisees went wrong how do we keep from going in that same path and i think this is an area where we really need to have consideration for this because we can follow their path pretty easily uh, if we're not paying attention to God's word, if we're not taking time to truly study and be aware of what we are doing. And so if you do have any questions, you have a comment you would like, please reach out to us, um, not just comment on social media, but but actually make an effort to reach out to us because we would enjoy you know that discussion. Sadly, great. I 100% agree. Like if for some of this stuff or all of this stuff, anything you hear, honestly, reach out to us. We have an Instagram. We have an, uh, an email. Reach out to us. We'll set up time to sit down and talk through these things with you to kind of explain more where we're coming from. Sadly, I couldn't find the passage, but it's Christ when he's talking about dealing with a sinning brother. And I thought it was in Matthew and I could not find it. Um, where he talks about like first you start out, you approach the man directly, then with two or three witnesses. And then you take it before the congregation. And then finally, you deal with them. As, or you treat them as if they're a publican or a heathen. Matthew and I 18. find it in uh, Matthew 18. I was thinking Matthew 12, but I could not find it. Um, oh, now that you say that, I see it exactly where it is. Um, but it's interesting how he kind of ends that, where he tells us to te teach or uh, treat them like a heathen or like a tax collector. When you think about that mindset, those people were the outsiders of society. And so it's like, all right, so they're, they're now at the point where they have taken themselves to a point of being an outsider. But yet you think of how Christ dealt with these people, though. They were outsiders, and those are the people he specifically tried to minister to. Those are who we find him going out and preaching the gospel to. So when they get to this point of, you know, they haven't corrected their ways, yes, they are now on the outside. But then we just we basically restart the cycle with them of like, all right, now we have to be hyper focused on this group of people to bring them back into Christ, you know. So when we hear that, it's very easy to take on the mindset of, OK, well, you know, they've fallen away, they're wayward, whatever. We've withdrawn from them. Now they're a publican and a heathen or a tax collector and a heathen, you know. So now we just throw them out. They're outsiders. It's like, well, they've put themselves as outsiders. But our responsibility, although it changes, we never we no longer treat them as if they're a brother to us because that's a different relationship. Mm -hmm. If you're my brother, then I have a lot more responsibility to taking care of you. Um, you know, all of those other kind of things as you would treat a brother. They've now kind of gone outside of that relationship 
but we have to then hyper focus on bringing them back in, you know? Well, and so as we bring this in, what did the Pharisees get wrong? Look at how they treated their own people, right? They looked down upon them. They called them sinners, right? And and looked at themselves as righteous. And so when we look at our brethren who fall away, let us have love for them. See that soul that and this is where we need to have that Christ like mindset and understand, you know, when we reach out to them, it's not listing all the reasons that they've been withdrawn from or bringing. I'm going to tell you, they probably once you bring it to them once. They probably know why they've been withdrawn. But as you begin talking with them, it's important to help them remember their first love. Right. Why did they serve God? They're going to have every reason to enumerate why they don't like the church, why, you know, they've been mistreated or whatever. Give them a reason to love the church and to love Christ again. And it begins with your heart as you approach them. And that's what the Pharisees had wrong. They looked at these other people and they just saw them as sinners. Right. Those who were not following the word of God, but instead of trying to help them, they distance themselves from them. Well, and to that point, kind of what we've been hitting on referencing where all of these things are coming from. Matthew 23 verses 13 through 15. I'll read. It says, but woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' homes, and for a pretense make long prayers. Therefore you will receive greater condemnation. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel to a land, or travel land and sea to win one proselyte. And when he is one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. And so we see kind of, we see this mindset. They're told that they're shutting up the kingdoms of heaven against men. They're making it so hard to get in that even those who want to come in, they're closing that door by putting all of these commandments on them, saying that you have to look, you have to act, you have to appear this way, focusing so, so much on the law. And like you have to have every single one of these things. You have to do all of this right to contain or to be a part of this group instead of understanding the heart of God, which is, yes, do these things but also value faith, mercy, justice, and all of those things with both and. But they focus so much on the law that if you can't uphold this unattainable system of commands, then you can't be a part of it. And then once you're a part of it, you get them so hyper-focused on judging people who can't uphold that law that then they condemn those who even you know, otherwise would be fine. They push them to condemnation and they cause those who have made it to become twice the sons of hell as they are, like making them overly focused even more than those original people are. Because if it took me this much effort to get in, it has to take that man twice as much because he's worse than I am. It's kind of my. And if we have this mindset, we're losing the heart of God who wishes for all men everywhere to repent and come to him. You know, there shouldn't be this high barrier to come in. Yeah. And so. Uh, again, our, our major theme here that this is just one example we brought out with uh, looking at how, you know, we interact with our brethren who have been withdrawn from, who have left. Uh, you know, we want to make sure that we don't have the same mindset, that we don't travel the same path that the Pharisees did and become and, and, and mess up and miss the kingdom of God. Because the minute that we start adding our opinions right as to uh, matters of uh, indifference towards salvation so this isn't going to be changing you know the method of worship it's not going to be changing the requirements uh, for salvation such as why are we baptized Um, you know what that confession is that we make how we live righteously But if we start to hold an opinion, like, say, I believe that Moses was spoken to God by a specific kind of bush. Right. And and I hold that as law. I've just added to the word of God. And it seems ridiculous, but it it happens. And 
uh, we need to be careful because that's where the Pharisees went, is they added all these specifications, all these minor details to these laws of God that it became impossible for anyone to live righteously in their eyes, uh, even for themselves. I mean, that's why Christ calls them out. So you don't even practice all these things. Well, he calls them in every passage I read. It starts, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. The next word, hypocrites. Because you hold these things so highly, you say you have to obey this command or this set of laws to the T, and yet you can't even achieve that, yet you're requiring everyone else, if they want to come in, to hold to that. And us as Christians now, that's the same application. Are we setting aside doctrines to where, like, you can only brush your teeth on Tuesdays or whatever? You know, I, I don't know. That's disgusting. I probably should have came up with something that's less for. <laughs> Less gross than just simply brushing your teeth once a week. I don't know. That's what came out. All right. But if you made something stupid like that, though, and say, all right, like if you do it on any other day of the week, then you're sinning. That's not correct. You know, or like we see in Romans 14, if you if you feel like you can't eat meat, yet someone else feels that they can, they can. There's no law on that. So if you claim everyone has to be a vegetarian or everyone has to allow meat eating then you're kind of in the wrong on that. You're requiring something that's not required by God's word. He doesn't care what you eat as long as you're obeying him. And so as we kind of go through, you know, thinking about how we're acting as Christians, kind of do a self-analysis. Realize, are we doing these things because we're trying to appear righteous like the Pharisees because we feel like in doing these things that we're making ourselves holy before God? Or are we doing these things from a conviction in his word? Are these things that we have found within the word that are convicting us to act in this way, that we can hold up book, chapter, verse and say, this is why I do these things. You know, not mere, not merely a, uh, an opinion that we have about what is being said there. Yeah. And so I think, you know, one thing to kind of help us along in this to uh, make sure that we aren't traveling that road is to make sure that we study the word of God, having uh a personal understanding of god's word is vital right that that's the only way that we can be saved i can't be saved based off of anyone else's knowledge of god's word so i need to have knowledge and as i study it then i pray right that i make the proper application that i have the courage to do so um i i praise the grace of god right? and i'm thankful for it because I understand I'm, I need time to grow in all these ways. Um, and, and there are things that I don't even understand yet, right? That I am doing wrong that I need to correct, but he's giving me time to correct these as long as I have that heart that can be molded and shaped by his word. And I'm striving to be, uh, to, to hold his commandments, um, right? He's gonna have that great, he's gonna have that mercy as he withholds that judgment, right? As I have another chance to try and correct my way day after day, to grow in my faith. And that's why in uh, 2 Peter chapter 1 and verses 5 through 8, Peter hits on, right? You want to grow in your faith and in your knowledge, in your understanding and all these things uh, or add to them. So you're continuing every day in all these ways um, so that you can live a faithful life. Um, yeah. and, and if I'm doing that, if I'm striving to abide in the word of God, then I'm not going to veer to the left, right? I'm not going to veer in this way of being to the point where I'm removing part of God's law. But I'm also not going to veer to the right where I'm going to start adding where the Lord hasn't added. Sorry, that's my chair. But I'm going to move that away from the table. So I'm not going to add to the word of God. It's just as dangerous to do this. Uh, if we're trying to push a law where there is no law from God. Um, we're going to have all the plagues that are written in this book added to us, right? That's just as bad as having our names removed from the book of life, right? Yeah. There's, it's the same thing. It's the same punishment. So, uh, you know, we want to be focused on that straight and narrow path. We want to be focused on doing what's right. And to do that, we have to see where did the Pharisees go wrong? They, they went wrong in adding to the word of God. So be careful not to do such. 
And kind of the capstone, what we want to hit on, I want to reread verses 23 and 24 of Matthew chapter 23, because it honestly, this encompasses the heart of what we're trying to say. What are you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites? For you pay tithe of mint and anise and have come in and have neglected the weightier matters of the law being justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Blind guides drain out of gnat and swallow. So again, uphold the commandments, but also uphold the weightier matters. You, you can have both and we need both. You can't just focus on taking on quote unquote the heart of God. You can't just focus on perfectly walking in every commandment. You have to combine both of those to live as God wants us to. With that being said, we'd like to thank you for listening to this week's edition of a Word of Truth podcast. I'd like to give you a friendly reminder that he who has ears to hear, listen up. Hey, that was getting closer. And as always, have a great week.